What if you didn't need to buy a router such as this one and you could actually build your own that does a lot more than just be a router and all of that for a lot less money. Now, as much as this little mini PC is a little bit bigger than your standard router, obviously, with the help of adding a little bit more storage, a networking card and a little bit more RAM, we'll be able to do so much more with it. Not only will it be our router for a home network, it will also be our Minecraft server for your kids, for example. You'll also be able to run it as a media server and so much more. Now, this is going to be a complete step-by-step -step guide and I'm going to show you how to install the operating system that's going to run it all. I'm going to show you how to configure and set up your router. I'm going to show you how to configure your media server, your Minecraft server and anything else that we're going to do. Now the PC that we're looking at is dirt cheap because they're going to be coming onto the market very soon because essentially all that's going to be happening is massive corporations are going to be upgrading their IT suite because that's a 7th gen i5 CPU and they are not going to be supported by Windows 10 any longer and you will not be able to upgrade them to Windows 11. Now I've picked this one up for £30 in the UK plus a little bit more shipping so all in for now I'm about £40 in whereas a good modern router costs you upwards of £70 or £80. Now whilst there's nothing wrong with routers like this and I've actually picked up another one after GLI Net have sent me one of them and that's running my dad's home network I'm a little bit of a tinkerer and I just want a little bit more from a home network. Now I'll have a full guide in the description down below the like button so you can follow along in your own time. But anyway, enough talking, let's get started. So let me now actually show you what we're gonna be building here and give you a bit of an overview of the components that we're gonna be using. And I'm also gonna make a couple of suggestions of things that you could potentially add to just improve it a little bit more and kind of get the maximum out of this little mini PC here. Now, the first thing I've done is I've upgraded the RAM and adding a second eight gig stick is gonna make a world of difference. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is networking. Now, there are multiple choices, but if you're planning on running this as a router, and this is kind of what I'm looking to demonstrate, you will need a second ethernet port. Now, as you can see on the back here, hopefully there is no second ethernet port. So we have to add one somehow. And most of the time you can buy one of these dirt cheap. Now, this one here is particularly special because it's a two and a half gig adapter, which means it's a lot faster than kind of your traditional home networking ethernet ports. So the ethernet port on the device here will be my WAN port. So that's essentially where the internet's gonna come in. And then this will be for the internal traffic here. And it will just speed up data transfer and the like. Now I got this one on Amazon, dirt cheap. I've got it all linked in the bio if you wanted to have a look at it. Now the next thing I wanna talk about is storage here. Now I've got two 256 gig NVMEs here and we have two SATA ports here, but storage is not the best on these little PCs here. They're kind of meant to just have a single drive in here with an optical drive, and that's about it. There's no redundancy built in. There's nothing, there's no M.2 slot because of the age of this device. Now that's a bit of a shame, but there is a bit of a workaround. And this is the power connector for the hard drive. Now what you can do for dirt cheap, I think this was three or four pounds on Amazon, you can get an adapter that expands to two slots here. So I can now connect two separate hard disks or SD, SSDs here, like so, which gives me a lot more flexibility here. Now, the only other thing you can do when it comes to storage is use another PCI adapter here. Now, this one looks a bit weird, and at first glance, you might be wondering what this is, but this is essentially for an NVMe. So it's an NVMe slot here. You can put an NVMe in here. Now, mine are currently in use and I wasn't gonna use this anyway because the 256 gig would be more than enough for what I'm looking to do with this. Now, the first thing we need to do before we install the software is actually create the bootable USB. And in our case, we're gonna be using TrueNAS. And I've not really talked about TrueNAS, but TrueNAS is absolutely amazing. And without kind of going into too much detail now, because it's a bit boring, I actually want to show you once the operating system is up and running. Now, for now, I just want to make sure I can go ahead and download it and create a bootable USB if you haven't done that already. So I'm going to download TrueNAS Scale. I'm going to download the stable version here, 2504. Now, I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to use something called Balena Etcher here. Now, if you're using Windows, you will need to use something called Rufus. In my opinion, it's the best one to create bootable USBs. There's a couple of changes we need to make. The first one for me is under security. 
and we need to make sure that secure boot is off. Now you get a big warning here, but we need to see here, secure boot is off. We want to make sure that that's disabled. Now the final change we need to make in the BIOS, and this all depends on where your settings are, but you need to look for something called virtualization. Now this is gonna be different on Intel or AMD, but if you're following along with the one that I've got, you need to go into security, system security, and here you need to enable virtualization or VTX, VTD. This is what you want to look for. And that's basically it. I'm gonna click file, save changes and exit, and let's reboot. So I'm spamming the escape key here and it's now gonna go take me into the boot device options. I'm gonna hit F9 and here I'm gonna select the SanDisk. And there we go, we're now in the Truna scale installation. So there we go, I'm gonna install. And now here it asks me which drive I wanna install it on. I'm just gonna install it on the very first one. Now here, you can choose whether you want to configure everything in the GUI or using this, the Truna's admin administrative user. Now I'm gonna go with option one here. Now make sure you set a super secure password. So set a password, confirm it, and then just wait for it to install. So Truna's has now finished installing, and it says, please reboot and remove the installation media. So I'm gonna hit okay here, go down to number three, reboot, and now it's time to pull the USB stick out. So you know your boot was successful when you on this screen here, and it tells you your web user interface and your IP address. And we can now go ahead and jump onto the IP address that I've seen, which was 10.040.121. Here we are on the login screen. So it was trunas underscore admin and the password you've set. We have officially logged in. We can see our CPU here. We can see how much memory we're using. We can see our IP address here, obviously, and we are gonna be making those changes soon, but for now, I just wanted to get up and running. So the first thing I recommend once we're in TrueNAS is I recommend creating a storage pool. Now, in our case, we've only got a one separate SSD that we can use. So we can see them here. We've got the boot pool here, which is this one, which we cannot use. And then we've got the second one here, which is, it just says NA. Now you can wipe this disc if you kind of scroll down and then you can go ahead and wipe it quick if you're just gonna be reusing it for your own purposes. Then we're gonna go into storage, create pool. Here, I'm gonna name it. I'm just gonna call it YouTube NAS demo, I'm gonna click next. Now here it's gonna ask me for the layout. Now, because I've only got one drive, I can only really select Stripe. It will tell me that it is not encouraged and so on, and that's absolutely fine. Now you can see everything else is optional. The log, the spare, the cache, the metadata, the deduplication and all this, that's all not something we need to concern ourselves with. We just kind of wanna get up and running. So I'm gonna click save and go to review, and I'm gonna go ahead and create the pool. Now, before we go ahead and install our OpenSense VM, the one thing that we need to do in TrueNAS in order to make sure that this is working correctly is we need to configure our network interfaces. So on the left-hand side, you wanna click on network, and then here we are gonna see the IP address. Now, this is tied to the physical device. Now, in my case, this is the two and a half gig port, I know that, and then the EMP3S0, I know that's the one gig ethernet port. Now, I've only got the cable connected for now to the two and a half gig port, but you can go ahead and plug the second cable in as well. So the one that comes from your modem or your router from your internet service provider. Now, once we're here, we wanna click on the little pencil and then we want to remove the IP address. Now, before you jump head first and click test changes, do not click test changes. We need to first configure our bridge. So we need to click on add, type bridge. Here we're gonna type in a BR0 because that's a naming convention. And I'm gonna create the LAN port first. So this is why I'm giving it a description. Bridge members, here's where you select the ethernet port. Now in my case, I know that it is EMP2S0. At the bottom under aliases, here is where you assign it the IP address. Now in my case, it's 40.121 and it's a slash 24 network in my case. So that has now been added. We can see that here BR0 has now got that IP address. Now, while we're here, we need to set up the WAN. We're gonna do the exact same thing. Click on bridge, BR1. It now needs to be called WAN. And here, I'm gonna select DHCP. Under bridge members, I'm gonna select the only remaining one. Now we can click test changes, confirm. And hopefully, if everything's gone well, you should stay on the screen. And now it's gonna ask you to save changes. So we're gonna do exactly that, save changes. Now, once we've got the network configured, we now need to go ahead and download the OpenSense ISO that we need. So you wanna to head to opensense.org forward slash download. 
Now scroll down to where it says fast download selector. The one thing we need to change here is from VGA, we need to change that to DVD because that's going to allow us to download the ISO. Then click download OpenSense. Now if you're using a Mac, you have to extract it using Kecker. If you're using Windows, you have to extract it using 7-zip. Programs on Windows and Mac will not let you extract .bz2. Now back in TrueNAS, on the left hand side, we're going to click instances. And at the top, we're going to click configuration. Now here, the pool, select the one that you have created. Everything else can stay as is. We're going to click save. Then at the top right, you want to click create new instance. Here you want to name it. Then you make sure you select VM. So on the VM image options, you want to click upload ISO, select volume. And here you want to click upload ISO. And here you want to upload the ISO you've just extracted. It's going to look something like this. I'm going to press select. That's gone ahead and selected it. Now on the CPU and memory configuration, I usually go with up to two cores and then memory wise, I like to give it quite a lot. Now on the disks, I leave it at root disk. NVMe is absolutely fine. Nothing else needs to be added. Now under network, here's where we're going to make a couple of changes. And here's where we want to select BR0 and BR1 for obviously our LAN and our WAN. We're going to enable VNC and enter a password because that's going to allow you to access the VM. And we're going to click create. So it's already up and running. It's really, really quick. Now on the right hand side, under tools, you want to open that. It's going to ask you for your password. You're going to click sign in. This is the screen you should be presented with. Now, depending on where that you've plugged your cables in, you should see an IP address on LAN and also one on WAN. Now, in my case, as I said, because I've already connected. If not, now's a good time to maybe connect it. At the bottom, it's going to ask you to log in, but we're not logging in. You need to actually read this line above it and you need to use the username installer and then the password is OpenSense. Then we're going to go into the installer menu here. Now, I usually just go to the default key map and then install ZFS. Drive is absolutely fine. Select the hard disk because there's only one and we're just going to leave it as is and let it do its thing. So OpenSense is now installed. We now need to set the root password to make sure that's super secure. And the final bit is to go down to where it says complete install. We're going to press enter and we're going to shut the system down because we need to change the hard drive size. So I'm going to hit OK, wait for it to shut down. So the one thing we now need to do is we need to change the disk size because we just want it a little bit bigger than the default 10. So I'm going to select 32 gig because that's usually enough. Now this is still a little bit of a bug because even though it says it's running, it's not because we need to now restart the router. So I'm going to hit restart. I'm going to force restart it now. So if you've done everything correctly and you've typed in 192.168.1.1 into the address bar, because that's the default IP address that you get, you should now be able to see the login screen. So we're just going to log in here. Now the password here is the one that you set and the username is root. And it's the first time logging in, you should see the system wizard general setup. So we're going to click next here. It's going to ask us for the host name, the main name. We don't need to do anything. Primary server, primary DNS, you can set it to 1.1.1, for example. Time server, leave it as it is. Set the time zone to where you are. Now, the WAN interface, we can leave on DHCP. That's absolutely fine, unless you have PPPoE details and so on. Root password, leave as is. And there we go. So the next thing is to update the firmware. So we're going to click on system, firmware, and then we're going to click on status. Then you want to check for updates and give it a second. It will go ahead and download the updates. Then you want to scroll to the bottom, click update, and let it update. And once it's upgraded, make sure to sign back in. Now, we've basically now configured our router. So now that everything's configured, we want to look at some apps. And this is where the beauty of TrueNAS is. It really shines with how simple and easy it is to deploy Docker containers and Docker images. So on the left hand side, under instances, we want to click on apps. Top right, we want to click discover apps. And here we can see a bunch of apps. Now, the first thing we're going to start with is relatively simple and it's open web UI. And you simply just click on install, make sure you set the correct time zone. Now, web port. This is the port that you're going to need to access open web UI. Now, in my case, I'm going to call it port 9001. The data storage can stay where it is. Don't need to add any additional data storage. Now, on the resource configuration, I'm going to leave it on one CPU and four gig is going to be plenty. And all I'm going to do is hit install. And there we go. It's now up and running. And all I need to do is click web UI. And it takes me straight through to the web UI. And now I just need to log in and then configure all my APIs. And the next app we talked about is creating your own Minecraft server. So once again, we're going to click discover apps. We're going to type in Minecraft. Now I'm going to deploy the Minecraft server for Bedrock. Click install. Make sure you agree to the EULAs. Now here, give it a server name. Call it something fun. You can also name the level. Now the type 
I'm going to leave it on default. Seed is also staying on default. Now on the game mode, obviously select whether you want it to be an adventure game, a creative game, a survival game. Difficulty, obviously that depends on the creepers and so on. Now the rest configured to your needs, so max player numbers, for example. Now the one thing you want to keep in mind is this port number here. Now you can leave it on the default, the 19132, and there's less chance that it's going to conflict with any other port that you've got open. Don't need to add anything else. Here on the resources, I usually leave it on two CPU cores because that's a maximum cause that it's going to be using and then I give it 8 gig of RAM and I press install and there we go it's up and running now the last app we're going to look at is Jellyfin now Jellyfin allows you to essentially stream your media library that you've got on a PC for example across to any kind of smart device as long as they have the app now the reason I left Jellyfin to the end is because it's a little bit more involved so the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to create a data set now I've gone ahead and created one already but this is kind of where my media is going to be stored so you would click on your pool that you've created, click add data set, name it media, and then you'd see the media data set here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to create a user to access this Jellyfin SMB server. Now, in my case, I've already got a Bobby user, but I want to create a separate one called Jellyfin. Give it a password. Everything else can pretty much stay as is. Now, you can, if you want to be specific, give it a special UID. So, for example, I'm going to give it 4000, and this is going to be important shortly. And that's it. I'm going to click save. So we've now got the user created and we need that 4000 ID. We need to remember that. So then going over to shares, we need to create a separate SMB share to access our media library. And that's where we're going to be storing all our media. So I'm going to click add. I'm going to go path. YouTube demo is fine. And I'm going to select media here. So we've got the one that we've just created. Default share is absolutely fine. Now, because I've already got a NAS running, it just asked me to restart the service. And there we go. Now, the one thing we need to do is we need to edit the file system. So at the minute, it says that Bob is the owner, but we want to make it the Jellyfin be the owner. Now, everything else can stay as is. We're just going to click Save, Access Control List. So now only the Jellyfin owner has access to this media drive here. We're then going to go back to Apps, and here's where we're going to select Jellyfin. Click Install. Now, under Published Server URL, it's going to be the same as the IP address of 10.0.40.121. Now, here where users and groups have access to this, we want to give it the one that we've just allowed in my case, it's going to be 4,000. And that's why we said it was important to remember that. I'm going to go down to port. Now here, I'm going to set a really random port, 3,099. doesn't really matter as long as you remember which port it is, and it doesn't overlap with any other one. Now the config storage and the cache storage and so on can stay as is. Now the transcode storage, because we don't have a lot of data, we're going to leave on temporary. So it's going to create that temporarily and then delete it. Now under additional storage, here's where we want to add the NAS that we've just created. So we're going to call this the map path media and here on the host path we want to select the media one that we've just created now everything else can stay as is i like to give it four gig of memory two cores is usually fine and then click install if we now take a look we can go into true NAS, and then we've got our media folder here i've downloaded the sample movie here it's just for demo purposes and that is in the media drive here so I've got the NAS, which needs separate permission, and then we've got the media drive here. So on apps, I can click on Jellyfin, click on web UI. This will now go ahead and ask me to configure an account. Now this is just a username to log in. We're gonna click next. Now here it's gonna ask us to add the media library. I'm gonna select movies here. Display name movies is fine. Now the folder here, I'm gonna use media. And we can see because we have permission, we could now drill down into more folders, for example. So if we wanted to split it up into TV shows and movies, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a general overview. I'm going to leave it on media, click OK, click next here. It's obviously select my country and region. Now under configure remote access, unless you want to be watching your movies from afar, similar to Netflix, you do not want to enable this and then done. We then just want to sign in. And here we can see the sample movie that I have recently uploaded. And this is how easy it is for me to view all of my content that I've got stored at home by just popping it onto the NAS. And so that's basically it. We've now gone ahead and created our device here. We've added storage, we've added network cards. We've done a lot of hardware changes, but honestly, for the price of not much more than one of these would cost with a lot more features, you've got so much expandability in this. If you wanted to, to add multiple, obviously, hard drives with the NVMe adapter, for example, if that's something that you wanted to do, there's so, so much stuff that we can still do with this. And I'm so, so happy with everything that we've been able to create. Now, stay tuned because we've got more upcoming series where you can create your own home servers with multiple devices because some people might want more power. So make sure you subscribe and also hit that like button and also let me know one of the projects that you would like me to create.